Welcome to KJV Home Bible Study from the Man Cave. This is JC Legar with Chloe Legar, and today we are going to continue with the Gospel of Matthew. This will be part 21. But, Chloe Legar, before I do anything, what do I need to do? Pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to teach your word. I pray the Holy Spirit would fill me and enable me to do it in a way that is clear and understandable and everybody can be blessed. I pray it in the name of Jesus and everybody said... Amen. All right. So we are going to be teaching or continuing in Matthew 9 through 12. And I want to give a special shout out to my beautiful fiance, Dunia. What, this is the picture that started it all. I saw her on Facebook and she's been following my Bible study. And I asked her, you know, when I saw her picture, I go, can I draw you? You are just beautiful. And, you know, I told her I secretly had a crush on her. And she goes, what? I have secretly had a crush on you too. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, man, I had no idea. Because, you know, I looked like this, trying not to be attractive, because I wanted to stay single. But she likes this look, which makes her pretty interesting. Because she looks so normal and beautiful. And I'm like, really? You're attracted to this? And she goes, yeah. So next thing you know, I'm engaged. All right. <clears throat> so enough about us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. All right, so let me take a quick swig. So we're going to talk about biblical Christianity, which is persecution and suffering for Christ versus the false gospel, which is the prosperity gospel. I'm going to use this example, I've used it plenty of times, so please bear with me. Because in April, I'm going to be taking a plane to Texas to go see my Dunia, so I can give her a ring as I propose in the right way. And as I get on the plane, I'm sitting there, and the stewardess walks up to me, and she says, Sir, please put on this parachute. It'll improve your flight. And I'm looking at her like, how is a parachute going to improve my flight? But I'm a nice guy and she looks so sincere. So I stand up and I put on the parachute and I sit back down. And I'm like, this ain't improving my flight. This is big and bulky and it's very uncomfortable. But I'm going to give a little time because she said it's going to improve my flight. So, all right. I'm just sitting there. And I look around and I'm looking at all the other passengers. And they don't have a parachute on. But they're looking at me and pointing and laughing. And I'm looking like, what the heck? And as time goes on, I'm starting to turn red-faced and I'm getting a little upset. And I go, she made a fool out of me. So I stand up, I take the parachute off, and I throw it on the ground. And I go, that woman lied. She said if I put on a parachute, it would improve my flight. 
and all I'm getting is mockery from the other passengers. I'm not comfortable. She lied to me. It'll be a long time before anybody gets a parachute on my back ever again. Meanwhile, another stewardess goes to the guy behind me, and she said, Sir, the plane's about to crash. It's a 25,000 foot drop, and we're all gonna have to jump out of the plane. Please, put on this parachute, and make sure it's strapped on tight, because when we jump, you wanna be sure it doesn't, like, come off. This parachute will save your life. Now that passenger puts it on, and yeah, it's nice and tight. And he couldn't care less about his comfort as he sits down. He couldn't care less about anybody laughing at him for wearing a parachute on a plane. He knows that if he jumps out of a plane without a parachute, 25,000 foot drop, splat, instant death. So out of gratitude, he puts on the parachute and he says, Thank you so much for giving me this parachute. It's going to save my life. Now, Christianity is like this, where when you're presented with the gospel, it has to be the right gospel. If somebody gives you the prosperity gospel, they're going to say, if you accept Jesus into your heart, he'll improve your life. Your marriage will be wonderful. Your children will be obedient and so nice. Your dog will love you. Your cat will purr against you. You're going to get a promotion at your job. Your car will always run perfectly. You'll find the best parking spaces at Walmart. And you're like, you know what? All that sounds pretty good. I'm going to give this Jesus of yours a try. So in an experimental fashion, you pray, Lord, I ask you to give me a better life. Give me my best life now. In Jesus' name I pray. Notice there was no repentance of sin, no believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. I'm only coming to Jesus for a better life. Well, guess what? My wife left me for my best friend. My kids are turning to drugs. My dog bites my leg, my cat scratches my eye, I lose my job, I get COVID, I get pneumonia, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? When I became a Christian, I thought everything would be so wonderful, and everything fell apart. So I get mad and bitter at God and these Christians that are telling me, if you accept Jesus, you'll have your best life now. Well, guess what? I got my worst life now. So I check it all and I say, you guys are a bunch of idiots. I don't believe in none of this. And rightly so, because that's not the true gospel. Now, the true gospel is we're sinners separated from God on our way to hell. And there's nothing we can do about it. But God sent his son into the world to take on our sin and he died on the cross he was buried and he rose again and jesus said if you will believe on me i will forgive your sins and give you my righteousness but if you follow me you will be hated for my namesake you will be persecuted for my namesake they're gonna kill you and thinking they're doing god a favor but on the last day, I will raise you up. You're going to rule and reign with me for a thousand years, and you will have rewards in heaven. That's the true gospel. And again, when you come to Christ, expect all hell to break loose upon your life and everything to go wrong. People will turn on you. They're going to hate you. This is Christianity 101. So let's look at some verses where Jesus explains all this. Thank you right there, get all my dunia pictures. All right. Yeah, I'm in love, I can't help it. All right. Here in 
John 15, 18 through 21, Jesus is saying, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. 1 Peter 2.21 For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. What's really cool is that when I did these, I'm also able to reuse them in another study like today's because the Bible tends to repeat itself you know the topic of suffering comes up a lot all right John 16 1 through 3 these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended they shall put you out of the synagogues Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. John 16, 1-3 And in Revelation 2, 9-10 it says, I know thy works and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Again, that's Revelations 2, 9 through 10. In Philippians 1, 29, it says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. In Acts 14.22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 14.22 And in Philippians 3.10-11 through 11, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So again... The Bible is not painting a pretty picture of Christianity as living your best life now with no persecution or tribulation. It says we're going to go through it. All right, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. 1 Peter 4, 12-16 and actually, Peter lived what he just preached because when the Sanhedrin was telling them not to preach in the name of Jesus, they said, look, you know, you testify. Is it better for us to listen to God or to listen to man? But we can't help but preach what we've seen. And they had them beaten. And as they were being beaten, they were saying, Jesus, thank you for the honor of being beaten for your name. It's like when a servant of God has that attitude, the devil is like, man, what am I going to do? These guys are praising God when they're beaten and killed. It's like, ah. And yeah, nothing draws people to Christ more than seeing you know, you're suffering and you're praising God in that? Like, wow. They know you got the real deal. First Thessalonians 3, 3-4 three through 4, That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And ye know, yea, and all, how many? All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're lukewarm and you're not living a godly life, you don't have to worry about persecution. But your chances of seeing the inside of heaven, I wouldn't hold my breath. But if you got the real deal and you're really living for Jesus, you got God's promise right here. You will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 But again, at the beginning... It says here, after you go through all the persecution, it says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So let's see some verses that deal with the future tribulation. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So in the future, people will be forced to take the mark of the beast, and if they choose not to, they're going to have to face the guillotine. But let's see what happens. In Revelation 6, 9-11, it says, 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That's Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And James 1, 12 said, Blessed is the man that endureth tribute or temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And finally, our reward is going to be during the thousand-year reign. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Wow. So ultimately, that's the future of the Christian. Right now, it's with the persecution of Christians, it's not something a real, like a false convert would want to be. If you're enduring martyrdom and you're seeing people killed for their faith and you're fake, you're going to go, uh-uh, I'm not a Christian. And you're going to deny Christ. But once Jesus is back, everybody's going to want to be a Christian. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, you're here, finally. Now I believe I can see you. And Jesus is like, and who are you? You're not on my guest list. You're not in the book of life. I gave you plenty of opportunity to come, but you didn't want to suffer for my name's sake. In fact, you denied I even existed. You wanted to live your life for you. And now you want to come to me now that I'm here and now that I'm ready to set up my kingdom. Now you want to be saved? Too little too late. Again, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you want to be saved, you come to God on his terms. And again, it will include turning from sin. Like that, when I believed, the first thing I had to do was to repent. And that means I turn from unbelief to belief. And I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And after I'm a Christian, I read his word, the King James Bible. He's got a few things to say about how I should live that is totally contrary to my flesh. My flesh loves to sin. His word says, uh-uh. When you believe on me, daddy's got some rules if you want to live in his house. And I'm like, oh man... So, yeah, I got to give that up. I got to give that up. And it's a daily walk with the Lord. He's very patient. And he's not going to bombard you with everything at once. He doesn't mind taking little baby steps with you. But again, your life will change. Because if it doesn't, you didn't get the real deal. Daddy's got rules. And he wants you to obey him. And if you are a believer and you don't, he'll take you to the woodshed and give you a spanking. 
I had a spanking not too long ago and I didn't like it. Ouch. So again, this is Christianity 101. If you're a Christian, you will suffer for his namesake, but in the end, it's worth it. Eternal life with the Lord in heaven or on earth, wherever he is, because wherever Jesus is, that's where heaven is. So, this is JC Ligar with Chloe Ligar. I hope you enjoyed this topic. Not very popular. Most pastors will never preach it because they want the moolah. I don't care about your moolah. You keep your money. I want to tell you the truth of the Word of God. So, if you like it, great. And if you don't, oh well. This is JC Ligar with Chloe Ligar. God bless you, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.